All right, we're rolling? <clears throat> okay. If you notice on the board, this is Psalms class number 11, Psalms 22, part 2, the praises of Christ. <clears throat> Last class we dealt with the sufferings of Christ. Um, so let's begin with verse uh, 22. There's a clear line of demarcation between 21 and 22 and what has happened up to this point and what's going about to happen. Verse 22 relates to the resurrection. Now obviously, obviously folks, all the verses before this related to the cross, amen, because they're all quotes from the cross. <clears throat> but... Um, and interestingly enough, a lot of these about the resurrection are quoted in the New Testament too, which is pretty amazing. <clears throat> so let's, let, let's just read through this and then we'll, we'll comment. Verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Has anybody ever heard that verse before? Ye, yea, who fear the Lord, praise him, all ye the seed of Jacob, Glorify him, and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Now that doesn't sound like the guy who was crying out earlier, does it? I'm a worm, you won't hear me, da 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 da. <clears throat> um, for he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hidden his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. <clears throat> the meek uh, shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. <clears throat> all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee, for the kingdom is the Lord's. And he is the governor among the nations. And all they that are fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. And all they that go down to the dust shall bow before him. And none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born. That he hath done this. All right. So again, <clears throat> let me start off by reading, lest I get carried away. <clears throat> Remember that I said at the beginning of this psalm, it's not just about the sufferings, but also the praises of Christ. In this psalm, we not only learn how Christ suffers, but we also learn what is the subject of his praises. Oneness begins to take place in verse 22. In resurrection, Jesus came back to the congregation of those to whom the blessing of the new man belonged. In the midst of the congregation will I sing praise to thee. All the suffering and sorrow were gone now, and the reason for them were satisfied. <clears throat> His joy he would share with those he loved. He himself leads the praises. You didn't know Jesus was a worship leader, did you? <clears throat> God's rejection of man has turned. Compare verse 24 and 25. He had been in the depths for us, but now he is out and praising. And how should we praise? With him in the certainty of what he has accomplished. <clears throat> so so he's, he's beginning, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. And so this, this whole thing is, is that he has come up in victory <clears throat> because... Now, the only reason why he can spread this victory to his brethren is because he died so that they could be saved. Or he died so... And, you know, we always think in terms of modern-day Christianity salvation. But let's put it on this term. He died so that life could come forth. Because that's an eternal principle. Long after no one needs saving or that phase is gone he will still be giving himself in a selfless manner. Do you believe that? I mean, that's who he is. How can he, how could he do anything different, you know? And um, 
And that's what we mean, uh, that life comes out of death, and that our, our losses actually redound back to the glory of God and the help of others. And so, um, uh, so, so here he comes. He comes back in the midst of the congregation in resurrection. Now, this is very similar to the high priest, folks, who goes in, and he goes through this process of killing a bullock and taking, taking its blood in and then coming out, back out. And you remember in some of the classes I taught, there's first on the Day of Atonement, there's a bullock or a young bull that is killed, and that represents the high priest and his family. Well, that represented the death for their sins, but for Jesus, he had no sins, but it still represents him dying for us in, in substitution. That is only for him as a substitute, because Jesus as a substitute did for you what you wouldn't or couldn't do, all right? But then he goes back out, and he takes a goat, and he kills that goat, and then he takes another goat, and they put all the sin on it and send it out in the wilderness, and then he takes the blood of the goat that he killed and he brings it back in and that goat represents Jesus dying as us and we are identified with him in that one and the bullock or the young bull we're not identified that's his death of substitution period but in identification we are identified with him what do I mean by that if you're not catching that very simply this how many of you are familiar with scriptures that say Jesus died for you raise your hand Good, because if you don't, I need to meet with you after class. <laughs> Jesus died for you. That's a substitutionary work. He was substituted in our place. When we should have died, he died. Amen? All right. How many of you are familiar with scriptures that say when he died, we died? Raise your hand. Okay? It's just that is um, identification. We are identified with him in that death. It's different than him dying for us. Now, in that frame of reference, he's dying as us. Perfect example, Galatians 2.20. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. That's identification. That's the goat. Substitution is the bullock. And remember, the high priest didn't go in once. He went in at least twice. First, as a substitute, as a mediator, he went in for us. The second time, as it were, now we're talking about the high priest on the Day of Atonement. Jesus fulfilled all of this. Uh, the, the second time, of course, Jesus fulfilled all sacrifices in one sacrifice. And so he goes in the second time, and there it is what I call a lamb goat because it was the lamb laying down his life. And the, the example I use for that is in Peter where it says, you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold by the precious blood of the Lamb. Anybody familiar with that scripture? You're redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. But I got news for you. The blood that was sprinkled on the Holy of Holies wasn't lamb blood, it was goat blood. Day of Atonement blood. There was only a goat. Am I right or wrong? Goat blood. Well, what does goat represent? Well, let's, let's start with the Satanists. What does a goat represent? Them. <laughs> it, re it represents Satanism and everything. Okay. So the precious blood of the lamb is the lamb who became a goat and died for us. You say, well, where do you get that from? Well, what, 1 Corinthians 5.21, He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in union with him. And so... Um, there is this, uh, this picture that we're getting in Psalm 22 in the first uh, 21 verses of the scapegoat. Do you see it? Everything's laid on him. He's the scapegoat. He is, and he is the bullock, and he is the, the, the goat that's going to be slain. But at beginning with verse 22, he's the high priest now that comes out to the people. And if you know the order, the high priest would go 
would go through this process. All this death is going on. All this killing is going on. All this blood is everywhere, and he's sprinkling everywhere, and he's making his way through everything, and blood's on everything else, and goes into the Holy of Holies, and then comes back, and then goes through the same process again, and that's exactly the way it's worded in um, Numbers or wherever. I forget the place that it's saying that. But it says, even as you did to the bullock, do also to the goat, meaning you do the same thing because it is the same thing, except this time it's identification. We're that goat. We're the ones who deserve to die. He didn't deserve to die. He never sinned. The soul that sins shall die. And he never sinned, so he didn't, he didn't have to die. Why did he die then? Because he became one with us. And he took us. He didn't, as a, as a substitute, he died for our sins. As, a, as in identification, he died so we would die. So that in resurrection, the one new man would be Jesus in his many-membered body, which is you and me, his new body. Okay. I hope this is making a little bit of sense. We have taught this before, but uh, there's always a lot. I always put a lot out there, so I don't expect you to get everything. But it's the main reason why I don't give tests. <laughs> How you can get it all. But what I'm telling you is really basic Christianity, but it's deeper than basic Christianity in the sense that there is a living reality of that that we are related to by oneness. All right, so Jesus now, beginning with verse 22, he's no longer the scapegoat. He's no longer the bullock. He's no longer the goat that is slain. He's the high priest coming out to the people. And that was the whole thing. All of Israel would gather together on the Day of Atonement and this was, if you remember the, the uh, Yom Kippur, the phrase Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, means the day. Not a day, but the day. This was the day. And all of Israel was required to come up and to gather outside and to wait for the high priest. And so he would go about this thing. And if God didn't accept the high priest's offerings, that meant all of those people were still in sin. See, that'd be a, so this is important that the high priest do it right. So our great high priest, he bears it all, but he bears it in the right spirit. Now, folks, you can bear all of this stuff and do it in the wrong spirit. And let me just say it like this. That doesn't count. <laughs> that doesn't count. Because the whole point is, is that it needs to be Jesus. And the whole point is, we probably aren't going to be going through that until Christ has formed in us enough to at least for us to know that it should be Jesus <laughs> instead of, you know, doing it ourselves. Because we can't. We are selfish. We are self-centered. Christ isn't. That's why he becomes our life. That's why he, it must be Christ in it. So... He's not going to put you through the depths of the first part of Psalm 22 until Christ is formed in you to a certain degree. Some of you are going, well, you talk about it as if it's coming tomorrow. You know, for some of you, you you're going to be old like me before it happens. Uh, the, this guy that's I got working on training my dog, he said, well, how old are you? And I said, well, let's put it this way. I knew Jesus when he was still a carpenter. <laughs> he liked it. But I, but I am being honest. I, some of you, some of you may never experience what I'm talking about. Really, honestly. Some of you, it may be your latter years, because you it's it doesn't happen overnight. The the thing is not to pray that it doesn't happen or or worry on your way there. There's one thing you should be concerned with that Christ may be formed in you. Why, for what's coming? No, because you have a heart after God, because you just want Jesus formed in you. And if you'll keep your pace with God, you'll meet all the things along the way in the right timing as you move along that line. But it's all, and, and the, the reason why David did, the reason why David wrote this and 
and, and was able to get through this was because he had a heart after God. Simple, very simple, very singular, very, you know, one thing have I desired. I mean, David was not a complicated person, <laughs> you know, and he really stuck with that. He stuck with that, that heart for God. And, and when these things came upon him, Christ was formed in him enough that it was fine. So, so I say all that to say, you don't have to worry about it because the high priest has already gone through this and sat down. The work's finished. You're fine. If you never go through it, he did go through it, and it's still settled. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah. You know? You know, because we worry. We worry so much. And I'm not, you know. Uh, anyway, so we're on the high priest. And so the high priest would go through all of this and all of the ugliness of the first part. But then when he stepped out, he stepped out to the people. And the fact that he stepped out meant God has accepted the sacrifice. And that's what Jesus did. He rose from the dead, but then he came back and appeared for 40 days. And, and what did he say? Peace be to you. Do you remember, anybody remember that? You know, peace. It's okay now. God accepted the sacrifice. Peace, you know. Uh, the disciples are, you know, out in the boat fishing. Peace, you know. What is that? You know. <clears throat> Thinking a ghost had appeared or something, you know. So, his appearance, his appearance, and you can say, if you, if you want to say it, you could say the revelation of Christ is the very proof that the work is done. Why? Because Jesus said, I must go away, but when I, when I, uh, but when I do, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and he's going to take that which is of me and show it unto you. The revelation of Christ is the proof that he has been glorified, okay? <clears throat> and so, of course, all the people would rejoice and everything. Well, this is it. This is the beginning of that process. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. In fact, somewhere along here, doesn't it even say, yeah, look at verse 25. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. What's the difference? Or what is he talking about? The great congregation, folks, isn't Sunday morning service. The great congregation is all of Israel gathered up in Jerusalem waiting for the appearing of our high priest. Okay? So, um, my, my question is, you know, some kids are just loud and rebellious. I just... <coughs> <laughs> Amen. That is the sweetest baby you'll ever see. <clears throat> so the question is, on a real level, not doctrinal, have you heard, have you heard the voice of Jesus in the congregation yet? Have you heard, I mean, has he appeared to you? Has, have you heard the voice of this one who went through this nightmare, this horror? Have you heard his voice declaring to you the reality of what he's done. That's, that's reality, folks. That's not pie in the sky, and it's not doctrine, it's not playing at church. We need to hear the voice of the risen Christ concerning how he feels about how everything went. We're all worrying about us. We're looking at ourselves. We're comparing ourselves. We're all caught up in the, our failures. We're everything else. We're looking everywhere and listening to everything but our great high priest. He would say to you, it's done. He would come with rejoicing. He would come with praise and glory, you know, just going, oh, man, it's done. You know, and we have to hear that from him. And that was the thing. All Israel had to hear that from him. It wasn't good enough to not come up to Jerusalem and somebody say, he showed up again. You know, you'd actually be kicked out of the congregation for that kind of stuff. Well, sadly, a whole lot of people have been kicked out of the true congregation, if you really understand what I mean. 
because they haven't heard his voice for themselves. And we, and, and that's not, there's no fear and trembling behind that. There's, there should be a hunger. There should be, man, I want to hear this stuff from Jesus. I, you know, it's great that Randy or Brother Lumen or this person or that person can hear this stuff. But my Lord, I want to hear him say it to me. Because why? Because me, I'm just talking. I just talk into the air. But when the Lord speaks, it just melts you. When the Lord tells you his heart, not just the facts, it just melts you. And so there should be a cry, a cry to, re to have some sort of relationship, to have some sort of a, 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 a place where we can say, I have a relationship with the high priest. Most people's relationship with the high priest is they go in and, and, and he's sitting on the throne and they tell him all the stuff they did wrong. You know. And many people even there don't know that's their high priest. They're just talking to Jesus. You know. But let me tell you, there's a whole lot of stuff in the, in the Old Testament that clearly, I've been reading in it a lot lately, and it clearly identifies this fact that he's not talking about you know, when he's talking to him about someone like Aaron, he's not just talking like he is talking about Moses or Abraham. He's talking about the high priest and what you're supposed to have between him and you. You know, we, ju we just, it all falls under the name Jesus to us. It, it shouldn't. It's not. You know, uh, we need to know him in his different aspects and have a relationship with him on that. Well, the high priest is the one who knows how the sacrifice went. And the high priest is the one who knows how the father responded when he come, came through that veil. And that veil was rent. And he sat down the first time anybody ever sat down on that chair. The mercy seat. Hallelujah. So my prayer, and genuinely my prayer, is that we all may hear him we all may know him from the least to the greatest. That we all may know him. <clears throat> so I wrote, have you heard this voice of Christ in the congregation yet? It is no longer the cry of being forsaken. The atonement is made. He gathers around him those who receive him and in their midst sings praises to God. Can you just hear Jesus singing praises to God? You know, says that with, that, that with st strong crying and tears, he cried unto the Father that he might raise him from the dead. Now he's raised. There's no more tears, no more crying. You know, I've often thought of that because it says, book of Revelation, there'll be no more tears, no more crying, you know, and then John's taken up there and he's looking for somebody who can open the seals and everybody starts crying. I thought there wasn't going to be any more crying. Well, I think there's not going to be any more crying with the high priest, and we're one with him that sat down. We were raised up and made to sit together in heavenly places. Well, that one it's talking about when it says that isn't the random generic Jesus. It's our high priest. The high priest sat down. The work is done. See? And um, so... The atonement is made, he gathers around those who receive him and in their midst sings praises to God. And so it's almost like this, I long for you and I do with all my heart and I pray, I pray more now, I, I would say this, I probably pray more now than I did up to and the first early years of my salvation when I prayed a lot. I probably pray more now than I have at most of the times in my life and I pray for you. And I pray that in a very real way, we could hear Jesus singing in, in the midst of us. That we could just hear him singing to the Father and just be moved by that and the reality of that and the heart of that and to see the joy on his face and to realize in him, and we're one with him, there's not gonna be any, any more tears. They ended right there. You know, there's not going to be any more tears. 
out of his eyes, and he, the eyes are in the head, and he's our head, and that's good enough for me. That's good enough for me. I don't have to have that specific promise to me. It can be made to him, and I'm his body. I'm one with him. I'm a member of him, so it's still true of me. Um, from verse 22, we find nothing but grace. Christ is the leader of praise then. First, Christ is in the midst of the congregation praising God, and those that, that fear God are called to praise him in verse 22 and 23. And then in uh, <clears throat> verse 20, uh, let's see. Well, in verse 23, you who, you who fear the Lord, praise him, all ye, the seed of Jacob. And, and I always respond to this because Israel was Jacob. He just got a name change. And I believe when God refers specifically, not calling you Israel, but Jacob, He's referring to you in all of your glorious flaws, like Jacob. And he says, this is the rejoicing God of Jacob. This is the hope of Jacob's everywhere. <laughs> Hallelujah. How, how precious when I read Jacob and that he's the God of Jacob. I just go, you're, then you're my God, and you are truly my God. And then verse... Uh, and notice he called him the seed of Jacob. Glorify him and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. And this is, this is also death and resurrection. This is Jacob at his worst and Jacob in resurrection called Israel, prince with God. All right. Um, and then verse 24, for he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hidden his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. And here's the, here's the key. There's a difference between him answering the prayers of the afflicted and hearing the cries of one who is simply going through trials and one who is with Jesus in the cross. You know. We thank him. You know, we might even have a testimony that we use for years when he's just saved us from some bad situation. But when you have been through the cross and the depth of something like what this is like, my God, my God, why is that? And you survive that by Christ, you never forget that. And it's a little bit like Jacob who limped after. In fact, in fact the truth is, Jacob never limped. Israel limped. He changed his name when, that, when he wrestled with God. And he walked away from wrestling with God with a limp that he didn't have before. But it wasn't Jacob anymore limping. It was Israel. You know. And when you've gone through that, and you've gone through this situation, there is always an awareness. It's like I always reach up and feel my rope burns, but it's more than that. There is a deep inner awareness for example my my strength is dried up i'm poured out like water my you know my heart is like wax there is a realization that i am just nothing i in myself will fail but but you are the strength of my life you're not the strengthener of my life you're literally the strength that holds me up, that I would, I would fall into a heap of flesh with broken bones on the inside, just a pile, if you were not holding me up and sustaining me. And you don't have to be in trials to feel that and to, and to be aware of it and to, and to just go, you know, I, I will, and David said this in one of his Psalms, I will love thee, O oh God. My, you know, I think he said my strength. I will love thee. It is more than I will thank thee. It is more that I'm thankful. It's more than I appreciate you getting me out of this. It is, oh, oh my Jesus, I love you so much. I love you so much. And without you, I am a pitiful excuse for a human being. But with you, I am 
I receive honor, but it's not mine, it's yours. I receive this, but it's not mine or me, it is you. But you praise him in the midst of the congregation. You, and, and it may not be a worship service. It is being a walking, living praise. There he inhabits those praises. And so, um, uh, let me make sure here. Yeah, co commenting on that verse. Uh, actually, verse 25 says, My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. My praise shall be of thee. Uh, the result of the truth taught in this psalm is that they shall praise the Lord that seek him. They are not just praising him in general, nor are they seeking him in general, but according to the cross and the resurrection. Now, that's important because we read, uh, I will, you know, uh, they shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. You know, uh, praise ye the Lord and all this stuff. Folks, I don't know about the other Psalms, but every ounce of praise coming out of here has nothing to do with just getting into praise and worship, right? I mean, can you see that? I mean, it's, it's clear. This is all praise that has come out of death. This is all praise in relationship to the cross and into the resurrection. And it is, it is, um, uh, it is, you know, like the, the, the Psalm says, let the high praises. So much of our praises are low praises. You know what I mean? They're low praises. They're not, they're, you know, he is higher than the heavens. Oh, praise you that I'm going to go to heaven. <laughs> praise you that you fix my car. Praise you. Well, I, that's fine. That's fine. But where are the high praises? You know. And uh, so uh, they're, uh, what I said, they're not just praising him in general or seeking him in general, but according to the cross. Verse 25 says, my praise shall be of thee and not just what you do for me. Why? Here he sees the true object of praise, the lamb in general and in himself. Because he, David went through this. I, I'm telling you, I, I, there are no words that I have for this. I'm so sad that I can't express it better. But there is... There's this moment by moment living reality where I know what I am, Lord, but I know how you are, and I put no hope in myself to go through the first part of this. I am a worm, and, and here's the deal. You just start putting me in a situation to make me aware that I'm a worm, and I either want to run away or kill myself or... Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You, you know, it's like, I don't even need to hear this, okay? Because I'm, I'm going to self-destruct, okay? But then you say, Lord, I, I, just, I just honestly, and again, my words and even my tone can't help. I believe with all my heart that you are my life and that you're going to come forth right now. And overcome my soul and overcome my fears and overcome my weakness and my, my heart that turns to water and wax. And he does, and he does, and he does it more than that. He comes out in love and he comes out, he comes out victorious. <laughs> That's the only way I know it. I mean, it's not like you're just doing backflips, but you know, I mean, but there's this praise that says, my praise shall be of thee. Because when I went through this, and again, what, what is the word? Here he sees the true object of praise, the lamb. Do you understand what I mean when I said, not the lamb that died for the salvation, so we're all good. The lamb that laid down his life through you in the midst of reproach and despisings and mockery and what we could never bear in ourselves and you praise him in, and, and you, you give all glory to him and you praise him on the throne and you praise him who lives in you and brings forth that spirit and because when, you're, when that spirit is in you and on you and coming out of you 
who say this is not I but Christ. Not I but Christ. And who is sufficient to even try to describe these, these words that I'm talking about? And then uh, verse 26, the meek shall, shall eat and be satisfied. The meek, not the strong. Isn't in every church, not every church, but many churches, they're trying to get you strong. But here, the meek is verse 1 through 21. Who, blessed are the poor in spirit, meaning I don't have it. I'm, I'm not strong in spirit. Blessed are the hungry. I'm so hungry I can't lift myself up. I'm, you, know, you know what hunger does to you. I'm, I, in all of those, blessed are those who are totally unable. For I am able the Lord would say, for I am able, you know, and um, um, the, so that's when I wrote, the result of the truth taught in this psalm is that they shall praise the Lord that seek him. They are not just praising him in general, but according to the cross. Uh, the meek, not the strong, who were victorious throughout the cross experience. And here's what you say, I fell apart, Lord, I fell apart, I fell apart. I failed you. I fell apart. Well, no, you showed what you are. You are but flesh. All flesh is like grass. And the glory of man like the flower that appears for a little while and fades away. The sun beats down on you and you just melt. You're like a slug. You know, what's the psalm? One of the psalms says, like the, the morning mist is burned off by the, by the heat of the sun. No, you, you, when you say I failed, then you say I did. But you were the strength of my life, and you brought me through in all glory to you. And so that's why I said the meek, not the strong, who were victorious through the cross experience, because they, victorious in that Christ came forth, the true lamb. See, do, does anyone see the fallacy of trying to be lamb-like? The reason, why, the reason why some people who were here once hate me is because they thought I was teaching that they should be lamb-like, which I've never said, ever. <laughs> but that's what they thought I was teaching them because they never heard it was really Christ. And so they tried and they failed, and then they got mad at me <laughs> because I was asking them to do something they couldn't do. Well... I know before you do that you can't do it. <laughs> I'm not deceived. I can't do it either. But Christ can. That's, that's the key. Uh, then his praise is anticipated in the great congregation, and they shall praise God that seek him. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. They'll remember. They'll get in those situations that are beyond them, and they'll remember and they'll turn to the Lord. Praise God. And then uh, verse uh, 29, And they that are fat upon the earth shall eat and worship, and all they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep his own soul. That's it. You, th those that go down to the dust end up bowing down. I mean, you, you drop to your lowest place. You fall. You know, we, we want to come in before the throne, the great throne with Jesus sitting on it, and walk in through the doors, you know, and, you know, and of course it's always double doors. You know, as we walk in, you know, and, and then they go, oh, you know, do this. Oh, yes, Jesus, you know. No, no, no. This picture is they that fall into the dust, that have no strength, fall down, and they worship him, man. They say, I am just totally empty and dry and dead. And... But I look to you. Look to him, all ye ends of the earth, he just said. And not only that one, but, and, not, not but, but and, none shall keep his, alive his own soul. Your soul, your soul will win unless something higher raises it up. For example, and, and, uh, you don't see it as much now, but you do, you do still see it in places. 
where if you walk into a little town, you see it in Ireland, you see it uh, um, a lot of places on the coast. Um, you walk into a little town and all the boats, big, you know, big boats, fishing boats, they're all up, you know, they're all up on the shore, way, way up on the shore, you know. What is, you know, how'd they get there? And how are you going to get these things down? Well, the tide comes in and it lifts those things up and it moves them back out. And that tide is the Lord, and we're those boats that are just dry docked and empty, I mean, as far as strength to move ourselves. But a higher force, I mean, gravity is holding you down, holding you down, and you're stuck. But God has a greater force, and it brings that, that, that uh, uh, wave back in. It brings the water back in. The high tides come in, and all of a sudden, you're lifted up out of that stuck position. And back out you go. Um, you know, the laws of aerodynamics are greater than the law of gravity. And so there has to be a, now here's, here's my point. There has to be a genuine realization of this. It's great to talk about it. I would never want to just come and talk about it and talk and, you know, think, you know, want people to think I'm spiritual or I know something. My Lord, there are laws. I mean, the, the examples I gave you are just physical laws. And the, and the spiritual world made those things. You understand what I'm saying? The spiritual world is more real than this world. It made those physical examples. There are genuinely higher laws than the laws that are at work holding you down. We have to believe that. We have to go for the Lord with all of our heart. We have to, we, and, and you'll only discover that really not by listening to me or anybody else. I mean, seeds can be planted. How shall they hear without a preacher? All of that is the word of God, amen? But I don't believe the hearing just comes by sitting and listening to somebody because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It doesn't say faith comes by the word of God. It says faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the word of God, you know? So we're trying to hear the word of God instead of hear, you know? Faith comes by hearing, and then hearing will come by the word of God. And so there is, there, it's like we're all pioneers. You're a pioneer. For you to get, it, let's just say, if I was in the right place with the Lord and, and was one that could tell you something that you didn't know, you can't get to, to the place I'm at by following me. You have to be a pioneer yourself. You do. There's no way. The, there is a blessing of having someone that can plant the right seeds, and that God, but God gives the increase. God does not. You know, I, every once in a while, every once in a while, I'll have someone come up to me and say, thank you so much, brother, for sharing the truth with me. It just, you know... And uh, pretty much without fail, I say, you know, the scripture says when the heart turns to the Lord, you know, the veil is rent. I didn't do it. <laughs> and I say the proof of that is I preach to, you know, I preach to hundreds if not thousands every year. And if it was me, then a bunch of people would be getting it. So if you're getting it, if you're getting anything, it's the, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. Anyway, sorry if I'm droning on here. Uh, let me try to finish this up. Um, <clears throat> so in the great gathering uh, in Christ, this glory to the Lord will be universal. All they that are fat upon the earth, all they that go down to the dust, doesn't matter if you're fat and doing good or if you're falling in the dust, all of those, their praise will be of him. None shall keep alive his soul. The soul of men tends toward selfishness, which is death. Only, only the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The law, it's like gravity. It's a law. Like electricity, it's a law of the spirit of life. The law of it will raise the ships, 
people fly the planes, but it is not Jesus in general. It is the law of the spirit of life that only comes in union with Christ Jesus. It is what Paul said, I thank God through Jesus Christ, just before he said, O oh, wretched man that I am. And he, he, he groaned over his condition all the way through Romans 7. Then he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law, the, the, the gravity law of sin and death that pulls me down. This law made me free. <clears throat> and, and so what are the laws? The law of selfishness. The law of sin and death is selfishness that tends towards self. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is joyful selflessness. And then finally, <clears throat> verse 30, a seed shall serve him. It shall be according to the Lord, it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. And this is incredibly important here. <clears throat> Because it says not a, not a bunch of seeds shall serve him, but a seed. And that seed is Christ. And it says that in, in Galatians 3.16. It literally uses those words, which seed is Christ. It literally says it's not as of many. Okay, so how do, how do we translate that? Well, we translate that in several different manners. One is universal or, or corporate. You know, I wish somebody would come up with a better word for corporate than corporate. <laughs> somebody, please, find a better word. Uh, universal meaning that we're all included, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're one in it like corporate does. But it, there is that, that, that many-membered oneness. Did you find the word? Oh, yeah. Well, if you want to be Hindu, ashram, then. Let's just go. <laughs> We're, we're a corporate ash, I mean a Catholic ashram. You think we're persecuted now. <laughs> I don't want to listen to this side of the room, okay? <laughs> Ye that are spiritual, restore such a one. <clears throat> All right. But then there's this other side, and that is, there's this corporate seed, and then there is this individual that it is the seed, the seed, the seed. And each and every one of you, it is still a seed shall be counted or reckoned. It's the same word. This seed is reckoned to you as the life, as the strength, as, the, as everything. Christ is all and in all. All corporate, in all, meaning everyone that is a priest, it's Christ. Everyone that is a son of God, it's Christ. Every, you see what I mean? So that, that individually, it's Christ. In all. And corporately, it's Christ. Christ is all and in all. In, e in each individual. And so... That seed is counted for a generation, so it just keeps going. It is, it's, folks, it's, it's after the order of Melchizedek, the, after the order of an endless life. The endless life is Christ. The Melchizedek priesthood is Christ in everyone that keeps going. He never dies. Well, that's what it is. That's what it is. It's just the ongoingness of Christ. And, and it's a generation, and it's a continuous generation, but it is Christ, the endlessness of his life through his body and through us. <clears throat> and so a seed shall serve him. So there is no way that what you do and all of your little efforts and all that are going to be enough. It's going to be the Lord. It's going to be the Lord in you. And, you know, I've said this before, but I mean, there's just little thoughts like this that you never hear. Therefore, when I say it, it sounds strange. 
But you know, if you just went through the New Testament and looked at all the prayers, you'd find that most of the prayers are to the Father instead of to Jesus. Why? Because it's Christ in you that is relating to his Father. And yet, what name do you pray in? Jesus. Why? Because you're married. You're one with him. You're one. He's the one. Now, anytime I say one, if I forget to say it, you need to add in your mind, we're one and he's the one. Okay? Because when you say we're one in most churches, they go, yeah, we're just one. No, you're not. Just have some little incident happen that, you know, you're not one. You're, you're barely in unity, much less one. <laughs> and I know I'm right there. But oneness cannot be broken. If you have two, you can break that up. But if you have one, you cannot break one. I know. Jason's back there going, one half and one half. No, you can't. Spiritually, you cannot break one. Okay? And that's why he made us one. But he's the one. <laughs> and that's what we have to keep in mind. <clears throat> All right. So, and then verse 31 um, uh, let me make sure I got all that out. <clears throat> they shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. And what a beautiful ending. This is the end of what began with my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What a beautiful ending. Can anybody do me a favor and remember that at least... One time you remember that when I finished up, it sounded beautiful instead of, you know. And I think I do that more, but I don't think you remember my endings as much as you remember the process to get to that end. They, they who? The seed in all of us. They, the body. They shall come and shall declare what? You know, that what we say in the church is they shall come and declare we're righteous. Don't, don't we? But what does that say? We declare his righteousness because he is made unto us righteousness. He's righteous. You're not righteous. Did you know, I mean, just consider this, and I know, how much time do I have? Consider this. If you sinned one time, if you did something wrong, if you were forgiven, you're still not innocent. Right? And if you sin more than five times a week and got forgiveness, you're still not innocent. You got five things. And if you do that every day for as old as you are now, and some of you, five times a day is ridiculous. Five times within 20 minutes would be easy. Okay? <clears throat> so, so you've got all of this, and he says, I forgive you. Well, folks, that doesn't make you righteous. It makes you forgiven. Am I right or wrong? You'll never be righteous in the sense of you're righteous. I'm, I'm right. No, you're not. You're a wretch. You are a pitiful excuse for humanity. You're wretched. Here, here goes the ending. I'm, I'm blowing the chili, aren't I? <laughs> But I'm not finished yet. <laughs> because they, they come and they have a declaration. This seed, this one that is many. And that declaration is his righteousness because he's the only one that's righteous and I'm joined to him. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. That's what you say to the devil. You know, because the devil comes and accuses you before God. Well, he did this and he did that and that and that and that. And how can you excuse this? My God, you're, you know, uh, he's not righteous. Well, my plan wasn't to make him righteous. My plan was to make Jesus their righteousness, and Jesus is totally righteous. Without sin, without, you see what I mean? So instead of going, I'm just a mess. Well, yeah. 
then you go, but Jesus is just glorious. I will sing of him in the great congregation. I will declare him to my brethren. That's what we need to do. When you get down and out, we need a little more of this. I got one amen and a several oh me's. But I mean, that's really, I mean, that's it. They will come and declare his righteousness. But listen to this. Unto a people that shall be born. It's going to be to, to, to other people, to new people. You see, if this place ceased to exist, if somebody shot me in the head tomorrow and this place ceased to exist, this word's still going to go forth. It's, it's the truth as it is in Jesus, not the truth in general. And it cannot die if it's alive in your hearts. It cannot die. It cannot die. And they will declare it. Not only that, but the, the, the last part of it is, is uh, declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. He did it. He, he is our righteousness. He worked this thing out. He took on us and went to the cross and, and was forsaken and was despised by God because he joined to us. Despised by God because he joined to you and to me. And then came through the whole thing and rose again and made us one with him filled us with his life, and then we've got nothing to do but run out and tell people, even the people that are not born yet, about his righteousness. Don't worry if you're failing. That's what you'll tell them. Don't worry if you're failing. Christ is made unto you righteous, and when Christ is formed in you, he'll be righteous because that's what he is. But it won't be you, and, you will, you, and you'll know that he hath done this like we do. That's what you're telling these people that will be born. You're going to know that he did this, and you're going to rejoice in this, and you're going to want to tell everybody, and it'll be good news. I'm going to end right there. My last words were, it will be good news. <laughs> Father, we just ask you to imprint Lord, we, we, we use printing machines, printing presses, and printers and stuff to imprint the truth, Lord, that we see. But Lord, imprint these things in the core of our being. Lord, may we not be a people in this place that believe a certain doctrine. May we be so much higher than that, Father. May we be a people gathered at your feet to hear your word out of your mouth, not out of mine or anyone else's. May our hunger be for you, not for the doctrine of this place. May our eyes be fixed on you. May with everything within our being, may we be unsettled and happy with it because we are not going to be settled until you are coming forth in us, to us, out of us. That all that you've done to this point is wonderful, but we will not sit back on our lees and be at ease in Zion. We will ask that the Holy Spirit be stirred up to come teach us of the glorified Christ and that Christ will be revealed within us so that he sings praises through us of this glorious resurrection that the Father brought about and of this precious nature that was manifest in the midst of the worst crimes against the Son of God. Father, that our hearts may hear his voice, this high priest that steps out from behind the veil and comes back out unto the people. May we hear him sing. May we see the joy on his face. May we love to see him sing like that. And may the singing of his voice ring in our hearts and bring great joy throughout all of the Israel of God. 
for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dismissed.